Welcome to the next episode of Great War Story. Now this is the story mostly centering around George William Ladd Thompson. And I've used a number of photos that he took in previous episodes, so I think it's time that we had an episode that focused on him, and most particularly because he was a photographer and his collection of photos, approximately 80 photos, from his experiences in World War I is held by the Auckland War Memorial Museum. And it covers quite a lot of things that overlap with my grandfather's story. And also from the Auckland War Memorial, I found this. When serving in the army, Thompson called himself Lad Thompson to distinguish himself from another George William Thompson by the same name. The name Lad was his mother's maiden name. So that's where the lad came into it, but apparently it wasn't. Well, I don't know if it was his legal name or it was just how he came to be known. And I've used this photo before. It's rather a flattering self-portrait, I think. George William Thompson. And of course, the reason why I focus on him particularly, because he was with the New Zealand Mounted Field Ambulance. My grandfather was with the New Zealand Mounted Field Ambulance. It means when they left New Zealand in October of 1914, they were aboard the same ship in the same unit. They arrived in Egypt together and served together for quite some time. So, of course, any photos he took will be in close proximity to my grandfather. Now, on the Auckland War Memorial website, it has comments and descriptions of some of the photos. And it describes this photo as George Thompson and his mother. And certainly it represents that classic image of the worried mother sending her son off to war, telling him, now you come home to me, don't you take any unnecessary risks, make sure you wash behind your ears, etc., etc. Um, and while, yes, this photo does come from the photo album of George Thompson, I'm skeptical that the man in the photo actually is George, and I'll spell out why that is in just a moment. And I've already said that they were both were going about to board the Monganui, which means, of course, that my grandfather must have been somewhere quite close by when this photo was taken, perhaps just behind the cameraman, perhaps help, helping one of the horses board the ship at the time, but in any case, the same time and the same place. Now, when you go to George Thompson's military file and you look at what rank he held, you can see that he started out as a private, PTE, as abbreviation for private, and then that's crossed out and he was promoted to sergeant. He had nothing in between. And that tells me that at the start of the war, he wasn't a sergeant at all. Well, you can see the sergeant stripes on this fellow. This is not George Thompson, some other guy. It's a sergeant. Thompson is a private at this time. Now, I think I probably also mentioned that the Monganui had a lot of important people aboard, and most especially General Godley, who was in charge of the whole expedition. Now, pulling Thompson's military file, there's some rather confusing stuff about exactly when he becomes a sergeant, but it's clearly not while he was in New Zealand. So we have this part here, which is dated the 27th of November, 1916. And it says, reports, there is no authority to promote this man to sergeant as dental mechanic. Well, this is rather odd that they're making a comment that there's no authority to promote him, given that there's no notation that he had been promoted prior to the state. And it's signed by a Colonel Begg. And then it gets a bit odder. Oh, I'm sorry, before I go on, this is letter forwarded to pay office. So clearly it looks like, um, how should I say, he was getting overpaid. They'd given him a field promotion to sergeant and he was drawing the pay of a sergeant and they've told the pay office, no, that's not right. You've been overpaying him. Now, the reason why this is odd, look at the date, 12th of November, 1915. Now, it's possible that's a mistake, or it's covering something that happened earlier. But I th don't think it is a mistake, given the date of 1915. Because if you look over on the right, you see the location is Anzac. 
i.e. it's at Gallipoli. Well, they evacuated Gallipoli in December of 1915, so I don't think that can be a mistake, the date, but it's out of order. My guess is, in the confusion of what was going on at Gallipoli, particularly in November, remember they evacuated in December, maybe the not, not all the notations were being put in the military files, and they remembered that they'd given him a field promotion, but forgotten to write it in his file, and had to go back and write it in later. And it says here, appointed temporary sergeant whilst employed as dental mechanic. Um, and uh, he's replacing somebody else who's sick. Well, I guess it seems funny that they needed a dentist when they're in the middle of the battle at Gallipoli, but I guess, well, you've got to remember that dentists are quite skilled at repairing smashed jaws and other things, which, of course, there'd be plenty of soldiers suffering from those kind of things at Anzac. And I guess you still get dental aches and and other problems with your teeth, even in the middle of a, a long campaign. And it does say the letter is signed again by Colonel Begg. So here's what I think happens. He's at Gallipoli. He gets a field promotion given to him by Colonel Begg. Later on, they find that it wasn't authorized, and that's noted up there. But then later on, they sort it out and finally get him promoted to, to sergeant properly. And the guy on the right, that's Colonel Begg who was trying to, I think, trying to sort out this whole mess. And uh, the one detail I learned about him that was rather sad was he didn't even survive the war, but he wasn't a battle casualty. His military file says he died of pneumonia. Well, as you're probably aware, the Spanish flu started to rip through in 1918, 1919, and killed, well, more people, in fact, than were killed in battle in World War I. And I do wonder if he was a victim of the Spanish flu. Now, other things, many interesting things of the, in the photo album. So this is a photo taken aboard the Monganui. And this one I was able to identify pretty easily, even though the photo didn't have anything written on it, as Hobart, Tasmania. So it was the first stop after they left New Zealand. So far, so good. There's this photo in his photo album that has caused me headaches. I've spent so long trying to identify where this is. Now, I'm pretty sure it's not Wellington in New Zealand. And then when they left, the fleet went to Hobart. I'm almost certain it's not Hobart. Then they went to Albany in Western Australia. Almost certain it's not that. Then they went to Colombo in Sri Lanka. Almost certain it's not that. They stopped at Yemen to coal. Almost certain it's not that. They went through the Suez Canal. I'm sure it's not that. Then they landed at Alexandria in Egypt. None of these ports seems to match what we're seeing in this picture. Um, it does look like it's the same ship, the Monganui, that we're seeing in these shots. But maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe it's from a later time period when he's perhaps going from a port in France or England. But... I have completely failed to ID where this is. So if anybody can recognize it, I mean, that hill in the distance has a very distinct profile, as does this um, interesting building sort of just in front of the hill. Like, what on earth is that? So I'm sure there must be somebody out there who can identify where this photo is. If anybody who watches this, um, this episode knows, I would love to hear from you. And then, after they get to Egypt, we have some lovely shots of what life was like. And if you look you, in the background, you can see that both of these photos are taken at almost the same location. So it's basically a moving street shot. You can see all of the busy, crowded street. You've got the tram service running along the train lines. You've got various motor cars. You've got, well, there's a New Zealand ambulance up there. Who knows? Maybe that's Mrs. Goodchild. And... You have um, some horse-drawn carriages and all sorts of interesting um, civilians. So that's what life was like in Cairo in late 1914, early 1915. And this one, uh, he has a very sarcastic comment attached to this photo. The beautiful Nile, I don't think. It looks very beautiful here in this photo, but the water is like mud. So I guess he um, didn't think it was the most attractive view and when he was there in person, even if the photo does look rather nice. And here's a typical tourist spot. You can see the red crosses on the arms of the various men. So they're clearly from the New Zealand Mounted Field Ambulance, taking a classic 
tourists snap in front of the Sphinx with the pyramids. And one thing which um, perhaps I'll even make another episode about this in the future, I don't know. The New Zealanders and the Australians were extremely well paid compared to the English troops who were stationed in Egypt. And when they arrived, approximately 30,000 men with money in their pockets ready to spend, burning a hole in their pocket as the saying goes, well, you know, what's the saying about um, spending like a drunken sailor? They should probably say spending like an Anzac because they arrived in Egypt and they just dished out their money. They rescued the tourist season because the t- it would have been a financial disaster for the, all the tourist operators in Egypt. With the outbreak of World War One. most of the European and almost all of the American tourists who would normally have been in Egypt for the uh, winter of 1914, start of 1915, hadn't turned up. They were facing financial ruin. And there are many, many photos of, you know, New Zealanders and Australian troops participating in all of the tourist traps. You can see these camels in the shot. They would have been there for, you know, tourist snaps. Ah, yes, sir. Have your photo taken sitting on a camel in front of the Sphinx. Ah, yes, sir. Cheap prices, blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, so the Australian and New Zealand troops rescued the tourist season. Now, this is the one photo that I think could maybe possibly include my grandfather. Because remember, my grandfather was in the Army Service Corps looking after the horses. Now, most of the three guys, the guy sitting on the horse and the two guys sitting at the front of the wagon are in the wrong kind of hats. So that can't be my grandfather. There's actually a photo of what my grandfather looked in his Army Service Corps getup. You see the pants are a bit different from what infantry wore, but baggy for riding on horseback. And you can see they had these uh, bondolier things they wore around them. The horse artillery used them as well. Um, So there's only one person in this photo who has the right hat. And who knows? I mean, there's no possible way I could prove it. But given that it's somebody in the New Zealand Mounted Field Ambulance taking the photo, and that's probably somebody in the same unit bringing supplies for the horse as well, it could be my grandfather or one of the other ASC drivers. Who knows? And some other nice shots. Outside the camp with Chris, Stu, French and Roy. Well, if I could be bothered, I might be able to track down who French was. At least that's a name rare enough. But come on, just a first name to try and identify who they were. But I also like this because you can see there's their, um, their wagons in the background. And there are the horse lines. So that's where my grandfather probably would have been looking after the horses. And this is a nice human one where they're again do, out doing some sightseeing, starting for the gardens and a bunch of troopers. And again, you can see the various red crosses and things showing that what unit they're part of. And then there's this one, kit inspection, Colonel Thomas at the head of the line. Well, he's quite faint because this picture is a bit overexposed, but there you can see Colonel Thomas. And I've mentioned him numerous times in plenty of episodes, and he was sadly killed at Gallipoli. And um, standard stuff for the army, really, isn't it? Kit inspection, you know, the officer comes through and makes sure that everybody has what they have and it's all properly cleaned and all the rest. So this is what camp life was like in Zaytun in Egypt for the members of the uh, Mounted Field Ambulance. And of course, I've had two rather long episodes about Valerie Goodchild and I showed these two photos and both of these photos were taken by George Thompson. And then... Here's another wonderful street scene from Cairo, not a posed one, just regular people about their everyday life. And this one here with this joke of a comment written on it. We went to the pictures together the other night. So what I assume he's making a joke that he had a date with this uh, beautiful young lady, shall we say. And then there's this photo, which I love because it's, I don't know, all these guys with these interesting poses. Some of the boys at the Sunday school picnic last Sunday. Now, what does he mean by the Sunday school picnic? Now, there was a joke about the New Zealand Expeditionary Force being General Godley's Sunday school picnic, because when they were aboard the troop ships, General Godley wouldn't allow cigarettes and he wouldn't allow any booze. Um, And all the Australian troops were allowed to smoke and were allowed to drink. So they... uh, called the New Zealand Expeditionary Force General Godley's Sunday School Picnic. When they got to Egypt, they finally did allow wet canteens and things like this. But I'm not 
quite sure if it's a reference to that or something else that I don't get. So some of the boys at the Sunday school picnic last Sunday. Three Timaru boys, including Eddie, Arthur, Bonin, Westport Company Office, and Corporal Thinlesson. It's only a shame the three are leaving. Now I had to go to see if I could actually work out who these people were. Now Bonin was the best one to go with because well, it's a rare, comparatively rarer name, and I had no trouble identifying him. Private Arthur Edward Bonin, and the sad thing is, he died of enteric at num number 15 General Hospital Alexandria later the same year, the 11th of September. He was 33 years old, and he was five foot four and a half. Which one was he? Not 100% sure, although I can take some guesses. Um, we do have a photo on the Auckland War Memorial Museum of what he looked like before he went to war. And the Auckland War Memorial Museum guesses it was him. I don't agree. I think it was this other fellow on the right. They even say their reasoning is based on his facial appearance. Well, both these guys look pretty similar. And I actually think the guy with the flat cap is actually um, George Thompson, the owner of the photograph album. I think he got somebody else to take the photo. We know he had a flat cap. So I think the guy on the left is actually the owner of the photograph album, our dentist. And I think that the guy sitting down on the right is Arthur Bonin, who sadly did not live out the, the year of 1915. And uh, and then Corporal Ernest Matthew Finlayson. Now, there's only one guy with corporal stripes there, so that's a rather easy identification. And then some other photos kept. Camp view, Eddie Drake in foreground. So you get a great view of where the New Zealand Mounted Field Ambulance were camping out. You can see the horses and things in the background. And given the fact that I'm quite sure that Eddie Drake had the classic um, cap, I'm pretty sure this one here, again with the interesting pose, is probably Edward Drake. And then we have this photo. Eddie and yours truly taken by Alan Brown. Now, given the clue from the previous photo, I'm confident that Eddie is Edward Allen Drake. And again, flat cap, that's go going to be our photographer. In fact, if you look very carefully, he's actually holding his camera. And that makes this other fellow here, Edward Allen Drake. Now, who's this Alan Brown? I had a go trying to identify him. Brown, pretty common name, but there didn't seem to be any other Alan Browns who went out to war in that early draft. The only one I was able to identify was a private in the Wellington Infantry Battalion who was killed at Gallipoli on the 7th of May, 1915. So was it him who took the photo? I don't know. But again, another classic tourist snap. Now back to this photo. Can we work out who is Eddie Drake? So I've already told you, I think, this guy was the photographer, so it's not him. Well, we've already identified the corporal. I believe that that is the poor guy who died in later that same year oh, of what well, they called it enteric, which basically means dysentery. Um, and this guy here, well, I don't really have a good reason to eliminate him other than the fact that he doesn't have a red cross on it. So I suspect he's from a different unit. Could he possibly be the photographer or a buddy who's hanging around? But given the absence of a red cross on his sleeve, I've eliminated him just on, on that basis alone. So that leaves two guys left. And we have this photo, who is Eddie Drake in front of the Sphinx. And we also have one clue that he was five foot five and a quarter. That's what his military file says. That suggests to me that he's so insistent on having that quarter registered that he's a little bit sensitive about his height. And also the gut. So that would suggest the guy who's standing on the step to make himself look taller. And also that guy who's standing on the step is holding some kind of walking stick or staff. And you can see that Eddie Drake in the photo by the Sphinx is holding some kind of staff. So on that basis, I'm going to guess that this is Eddie Drake. OK, it's it's guesswork, but you heard my reasoning. And on the Auckland War Memorial Museum website, we have this postcard written by Eddie Drake to his sister Edith in New Zealand. 
and the comment on the Auckland War Memorial Museum because I thought, where did this photo come from? And annoyingly, it didn't have a scan of the other side of the postcard, just this side. And it said, sent from Egypt on active service, identified by service number top right, 3 slash 100 A, well that's Eddie Drake. Sent to a sister in Timaru, public, Ron, researcher, 14th July 2019, from card written by soldier in my possession. So I, I'm guessing that, there, well, there are these people who like to buy these World War I postcards and things like this and collect them. So I'm guessing that this guy, just by chance, had acquired this World War I postcard and had worked out who it belonged to and had, as part of community service, uploaded it to the Auckland War Memorial website. And well, I can't read it all, but it says, this is only a little cover of Port Sewers and does not give you much idea about the formation of the houses some of which are very big and the architecture is splendid. Nothing is seen like it in New Zealand. Um, and something about the buildings are glorious. The, or in Cairo, the buildings are glorious. The churches and public buildings are very fine, um, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a postcard written by Eddie Drake back to New Zealand from Egypt. Now we turn to somebody else in my family who I've barely mentioned before. In previous episodes, I'd mentioned that my grandfather was born in New Zealand, and I might have mentioned that he had two elder sisters. One of them died when she was young. She was only nine years old, probably died of diphtheria. But the other one lived to a ripe old age. And we always called her Auntie Connie, but she was my great aunt, sister to my grandfather. And, uh, and in our family, um, we happened to possess an autograph book that she seemed to have acquired, well, quite early. You can see there she was given it by her father, Christmas of 1907. And some of the people who have signed it or written entries, some of it were obviously her school friends, um, but she kept it and had other people sign it later in life. Now, why am I mentioning that now? Because in her autograph book, there is a signature, an autograph, if you like, Edward A. Drake, NZMC, New Zealand Medical Corps, September the 10th, 1916. Is this the same guy? Well, let's look at the signature on the postcard. You can see the way the D is formed is done in exactly the same way. That R is identical. You can see while there's slight variance, any handwriting analysis will agree with me that it's the same guy. You could compare some of the other letters, like the way he did the D in Edward, um, and you see the same D being written in other places. It's definitely the same guy confirmed by that postcard. So then the question, of course, comes, how does this guy, who's we're seeing there at Zaytun Camp in Egypt in front of the Sphinx and the pyramids, how does he end up in September of 1916 signing my grandfather's sister's autograph book. Now she lived in London on King Henry's Road and there's me standing in front of the house where they live. That's number 10 King Henry's Road and my great grandfather, you see him there on the left. Um, also in this group photo, he's a bit older there. This group photo was taken in 1930. You can see him standing on the, uh, well, our back right of the photo and the late the other lady well the lady who is circled was my great aunt connie not the best photo but it's the best i could find i sadly don't have many photos of her i also never met her which um i something i regret but i do plan to make at least one episode about some interesting things about her life at some later stage so this is where she lived in London with her father, my great grandfather. So presumably it was in London that she met Eddie Drake. So what's the answer to the story? Well, trying to put side by side Eddie Drake's story and my grandfather's story, Robert Bruce Fowler. So here's Eddie Drake on the top left and there's my grandfather on the top right. So they were both in the New Zealand Mounted Field Ambulance in 1914. Well, my grandfather, Army Service Corps attached, but still the same unit. They had left New Zealand on the Monganui, and they were both there when they were dispatched 
towards Gallipoli to the Dardanelles on the 12th of May 1915. So they've been together since at least, what, September, August, September of 1914 through to May of 1915. Now their ways separate at this point. Eddie Drake stays with the, um, the unit. He goes on to some hospital ships and is later landed at Gallipoli. But as I explained in a previous episode, my grandfather um, doesn't land with the rest of the unit because they decided that the horses and wagons are of completely no use at Gallipoli. So they send back the horses and the men who care for the horses back to Egypt. So as a result of that, during the entire period of the Gallipoli campaign, my grandfather has to kick around in Egypt, taking care of the unit's horses while they're off on hospital ships and at Gallipoli and all the rest. Now, Drake, who is at Gallipoli, suffers for it. He suffers from a GSW, a gunshot wound, to the thigh. Um, elsewhere in his file, it's described as being an injury to the pelvis at Chalkhill Gallipoli on the 12th of August, 1915. And as a result of that, he's evacuated on a hospital ship to Malta, and it was a serious enough wound that they didn't think he was likely to recover, so they sent him back to England. And, uh, and later, he ends up at Hornchurch. Now, Hornchurch, again, I'm going to make episodes about Hornchurch in the future, was the New Zealand convalescent camp. After the men had been to hospital and had their surgery and were out of danger, and they just needed time to rest and recuperate, so they could be ready to go back into action, they were sent to Hornchurch. So at the start of 1916, he's at Hornchurch. And, and after some time being a patient there, he actually gets a job there and remains on staff, working in something that's described as the Meccano Massage section. Um, some kind, well, I know you have these massage guns that people use these days. Um, I guess it was some similar thing that they had in 1916. Now, my grandfather, I've made an episode in the past about leaving Egypt and going to Marseille. I haven't yet made any episodes about what he got to got up to after that. And sometime in the near future, I will be making an episode talking about how he suffered a very serious wound to his right shoulder, a gunshot wound right shoulder, on the 14th of July 1916 near Amentez. Um, you can look forward to an episode about that later. As a result of that, he's evacuated back to England, has surgery, and after he's recovered enough from his surgery, he's sent to Hornchurch to recover and recuperate. So that is on the 19th of August 1916, he ends up at Hornchurch. And it's on the 10th of September, just a few weeks later, that Eddie Drake signs his sister's autograph book. So putting two and two together, I'm pretty confident that this is what's happened, that they've got to know each other and they're at least, I mean, I guess some kind of friends. I don't know how close. And then, of course, their ways separate. And then they meet each other again at Hornchurch and it's, hey, Eddie, hey, Bruce. Um, yeah, my granddad was never called Robert. He was always called Bruce. Eddie, Bruce, hey, how are you? Where have you been? What have you been up to? Oh, it's good. Now. I'm not sure how many New Zealand soldiers had family, a father and a sister living in London. And I'm guessing that Eddie Drake probably didn't know anyone. So he gets leave to go into London. And and so my grandfather says, well, listen, when you're going into London, you know, there's a place you can stay or you can, why don't you go and visit my sister and my dad? You know, um, I'm sure they'll be ready to look after you. And rather than just go into London, the big city on your own, where you don't know anybody, well, it was a natural thing to go and visit somebody there. So that's what I'm assuming happened and how he, Eddie Drake, ended up signing the autograph book of my great aunt Connie. And uh, Grandad was to remain at Hornchurch until late April of 1917. And I think that photo that's um, I've recently been colorized, that's on the top right, I think that photo must have been taken around about that time period um, in 1917. And here's a beautiful picture of what the entrance to the Horn Church convalescent camp looked like. And uh, you can see Grey Towers. Grey Towers was actually a, uh, a noble estate, if you like. It had a big grand manor, and the land was basically 
made available to the New Zealanders to use as a convalescent camp. Uh, it's in Essex, the New Zealand Convalescent Hospital. And you can see something I talked about very recently in a previous episode, the difference between the uniforms of wounded men and the men on active service. You can see the five fellows on the left are all in hospital blues, the uniforms they made wounded men wear. And the two guys on the right are in regular khaki. Now, to give you an idea of where is Hornchurch, it's near London, but not super close. In fact, when I was in London a while back and I was studying their incredibly complex map of the tube and the, you know, the underground system, I noticed that one of the lines heading out to the east, the very last stop was actually Hornchurch. And I did consider going out there to have a look, but sadly, the area where that the Grey Towers Noble Manor used to be is now just a housing estate. It all, it's all been knocked down and there's actually nothing to see there related to the New Zealand convalescent camp anymore. But you can see where Hornchurch is off to the east of London. And where that crosses is where my great grandfather and my great auntie lived. It's um, when we went to visit, we got off the tube stop at Chalk Farm and that big green park just to the south of it. That's actually where the, where you'll find the London Zoo. So I think not unreasonable that that would explain how um, Eddie Drake came to sign my great aunt's autograph book. And the only other detail I had of interest for him was that Drake working in these hospitals met a young lady um, a Hilda Pickett, who was a VAD. I talked about Valerie Goodchild being a member of the Voluntary Aid Detachment, and she was a mess orderly, and they got married. Now, the photo, that's not them. I just was looking for a photo of a New Zealander getting married, um, and I borrowed it from a, another website, of, from this New Zealand WW100 website. But anyway, that was the only other thing I had to say about Drake. Now, of course, the whole episode is centering around George Thompson. So we've got to bring it back to conclude with a few final details about our friendly dentist. Now, there is some evidence, mostly just from his photos, that towards the end of his service, he actually ended up working at Queen's Hospital, Queen Mary's Hospital in Sidcup in England. And there he is, he's easily recognizable. And you can see whatever confusion or trouble there was about his rank, you can see he's wearing sergeant stripes. So by now it's all been sorted out and he's a proper sergeant. Now, there's another fellow there who's very famous. That's Henry Pickerel. Because this hospital at Sidcup was where they established the uh, facility for repairing all of these men who had horrific facial wounds, that's basically where plastic surgery was first pioneered. And they had a lot of dentists because, as I mentioned already, dentists were highly skilled at facial reconstruction and dealing with broken jaws and all of that kind of stuff. So it's no accident that George Thompson as a dentist would end up there. And the two names that are usually associated as the, the godfathers of plastic surgery, a Henry Pickerel, who's in the center of the photo, but probably even more famous than him is Harold Gillies. And Harold Gillies isn't in the photo, at least not on the captions identifying them. So I'm not quite sure where is Harold Gillies, but Pickerel and Gillies, both very significant men in um, the history of medicine and plastic surgery. Now, that is particularly important to me because if you go back to the very first video I uploaded, the one explaining how my obsession started with my grandfather, I explain how it all began when these photos appeared of my grandfather in a New Zealand newspaper called The Listener. And nobody in my family had any clue that these photos existed. And they were from Queen Mary's Hospital in Sidkip because my grandfather was one of the beneficiaries of the work that were doing, they were doing there. And there was a set of four photos, a front and side shot before his surgery, and the front and side shots you can see here after the surgery. Well, actually, there were multiple procedures, not just a single operation, but they did a pretty good job overall. 
And so therefore, the story of Sidkip and the doctors and the men and the nurses who work there is very close indeed to my grandfather's story. And I do wonder if um, George Thompson was there. I think he probably was because it was October of 1918 when my grandfather suffered that catastrophic wound to the face. And did he recognize this patient who came in? Did he know that this man who was being operated on was one of these guys who had been in the same unit with him and come out on the same ship, the Monganui? Well, I think there's a good chance that they would have reconnected and re recognized each other. And, um, and just to wrap this up, um, George Thompson returned to New Zealand aboard a ship called the Tainui on the 18th of March, 1919. And this is, a, this is in fact a photo from the Tainui. And here it is, he's embarked for New Zealand aboard the Tainui, leaving from Plymouth on the 18th of March, 1919. Now, the reason why this is particularly interesting for me is that this is from my grandfather's military file. And what do we see here? On the 18th of March, 1919, he embarked for New Zealand aboard the Tainui, leaving from Plymouth. So my grandfather went to war aboard the troop ship, the Monganui, accompanied by George Thompson. And through a strange series of coincidence, he went home to New Zealand, also on the same ship as George Thompson. Uh, although the coincidence is perhaps not quite as strong as it first seems, because there was actually a whole contingent of New Zealand doctors, New Zealand nurses, and patients, all from Sidkip, who all went home together. So in that sense, it's actually quite natural. Pickerel was aboard the ship. My grandfather was aboard the ship. My grandmother, who my grandfather married on the 1st of January, was also aboard the ship. Thompson was aboard the ship. In fact, many of the people in this photo would have been on the same ship. There was this big contingent of doctors, nurses, and patients, and as spouses and things like this, who all went home to New Zealand on the same ship. And also, March 1919 was quite early, I guess, because they were all patients and sick. Um, most men who had gone to war, they had to wait till the latter half of 1919 before they got home. And that's all I have for you today. So I'm going to say good evening. <laughs>